Wednesday. So let's chat. Hi, I'm Kanan Chandran, the publisher of Storm Asia, and this is the Wet Web Chat, a regular series of discussions we have about topics that are wide and varied. And this week, we're looking at Singapore, and Singapore through the eyes and lenses of filmmakers and photographers. Uh, and in our panel, we've got some familiar names uh, and some fresh faces. So we'd love to hear what they've got to think about Singapore and what uh, uh, they might consider as a Singapore that we could project down the line. Um, I think a lot of our travel desire is often ignited by uh, photographs and visual images. And so they play a very important part in trying to fire up our desire to travel, to want to explore new places, to understand new cultures. Um, so how does the Singapore image reflect overseas? Yeah, we have certain things that keep popping up. We've got like the Merlion, we have the Marina Bay Sands, we have the sky, uh, sort of the cityscape, F1 at times. Um, all the things that sparkle and shine and, and are very, very bright on, on our on our landscape, right? So those are the things that tend to come to mind. But is there another way of projecting Singapore? Um, you know, uh, if you look at the Gross National Happiness Index, that's something that Bhutan has taken as its own. Uh, and that's been the image of Bhutan that comes to mind. Um, can Singapore get something that is less physical and more emotional in that space? So here to discuss all this with us, uh, we've got Russell Wong. Russell is a celebrity photographer who photographs celebrities. Uh, he's uh, photographed Richard Gere, Jackie Chan, Michelle Yeoh, President Barack Obama. He's photographed for numerous Time covers and uh, magazines and acted as himself in Crazy Rich Asians. So, and he's currently got an exhibition on at the Asian Civilization Museum on his pictures from Kyoto. Right. Thank you uh, and welcome, Russell. Thanks. We've got uh, Brian Van de Beek, who's a commercial and editorial photographer whose images span Asia, North America, and Europe. He's worked with newspapers in the US and Singapore, among others, and in the permanent collection of the National Museum of Singapore, uh, some of his images as well. Uh, welcome, Brian, to this chat as well. Thank you. Uh, and we've got Darren So, who explores the urban landscapes through his lens. Uh, his various exhibitions have showcased the changing architectural face of Singapore, and his works have been exhibited internationally. His uh, 2018 multidisciplinary project, Before It All Goes, was nominated for the President's Design Award in 2020. Welcome, Darren. Thank you, Kana. And making up the quartet of our panelists and beautifying the whole process, we have Grace Song, who is a writer and filmmaker, it has caught the attention of you with a short films, uh, Bat Soup, Dirty Laundry, and more recently, Metadata, all shot during the uh, lockdown, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and um, Metadata, which uh, will, will be screened soon as part of the Escape National Youth Film Awards. Uh, she's working on other commissions and is currently based in some part of Thailand. Secret, secret for a film project. So welcome, Grace. <laughs> Uh, welcome, thank gentlemen, you. as well, and uh, thank you for joining this uh, this chat. Uh, you've all sort of submitted some pictures of uh, of Singapore that you feel kind of represent an uh, aspect of it. We'll get to that shortly, but I just want to understand, what do you think is the role of the photographer in society? Brian, would you like to jump in on that one? Um, okay. Uh, I think it's very interesting because uh, all of us represent very different genres. Um, and I think all of us, at the end of the day, have the same uh, responsibility to capture the things that we see, uh, and Singapore in particular, uh, the way we see it now. Um, what does that actually mean? It, it, the, the fun thing is that anything that you capture, whether Darren takes a, a portrait, uh, shoots buildings and Russell shoots uh, celebrities, or for myself, just walk, wandering around the streets taking pictures, everything that we shoot becomes a document of, becomes a document of, Singapore as it is now. Uh, I think Darren, myself, and even Ru and Russell and Grace, I'm sure when we look back, I, when you ask me to look for pictures for this, I had so many to sift through and I was going back through some of the older ones and I realized that a lot of the things that I saw that I had were just not there anymore. And I'm not talking about 20 years ago, I'm talking about as little as two years ago or three years ago. Yeah. Uh, 
So things change so fast. And I think as, as, a, oops, sorry, as a photographer, it's our responsibility to capture all these things so that down the line, we have something to look back on. So you're a historian of sorts, right? For, for all of us are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Darren, how about you? I think for me, it's... Uh... I I see it every day. It's uh it's something that is it's very stark the change, uh and I I used to tell people this that if you leave Singapore for a month, after you come back, there will be a building that's been demolished and there'll be a new shopping mall, and uh it's actually not so far from the truth. Um and you know right now if you well before the pandemic if you arrive at Changi Airport. Uh, the first new thing to greet you would be a new mall. And, um, and I think that says something about uh, how Singapore sees itself. Uh, are we one giant shopping center with mm. uh, lots of condos and uh, glass and steel buildings or are we more than that? And, uh, and that's why I focus a large part of my, my own work on uh, photographing public housing in Singapore as well as uh, buildings that People may not pay so much attention to uh, older buildings that uh, are perhaps uh, under threat of being demolished. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Russell, how about yourself? Um, I'm kind of torn, you know. <laughs> it's like the current, you know, the current imagery that, uh, that people see, you know, from the media, you know, movies and magazines and TV you know, they, they see the new part of it, right? Mo most of the time. And, and everyone knows uh, MBS when they see that. So that's like the new kind of our, that's our new monument, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, even doing jobs, you know, uh, I can't help but have that in there. Or sometimes I can't help, but, uh, but, but like th them wanting that building in there because it's so defining now, like the, and I call it the Southern skyline or the new skyline. If we don't have that in there, people don't know it's Singapore, right? Because mm. it's, just, you know, it's just a cluster of, of, of uh, you know, office buildings in Shenton Way, which has always been the, the main CBD mm. area. Um, yeah, it's, it's good and it's bad. You know, it's good and it's bad. And, and I always believe that at least they recognize you at first, mm. you know, and then you can figure out a way of just this, this kind of steering them to the other things and the other iconic images that, that represent, you know, but it's it's like you know F one is around there. It's new from two thousand you know mid two thousand. Crazy rich Asians had to shoot there. A lot of Japanese commercials had to shoot there. The Docomo, all you ask all the Japanese uh, uh, people, they know that just as the mobile phone building, because that's where the big commercial was shot there. Yeah, and, and of course it's new. That's why everyone uses it, you know. And like Darren said, uh, you know every every three four years a new building shoots up. And maybe they're waiting for another one to shoot at, yeah. right? So uh, yeah. it, it, it's kind of moving. It's kind of moving, but obviously it's moving towards like what is new here because we're trying to sell ourselves as like a tech city, a new city, you know, the new world. We are, you know, we, are, we, we got everything all figured out and, and, and everything is modern and we are like cutting edge. And I guess that's why this, these, image, you know, these images come up, yeah. you know? I mean, although me being Peranakan, I still think the Pranakan house is very iconic in terms of, mm -hmm. I think when people see that, right? They cannot still think of Singapore, yeah. right? So that's the, so his, the historical the, part of it, yeah. Yeah. So part of what he's saying is that uh, the current imagery of Singapore is that of an icebreaker, right? At least, yeah. you, oh, this is Singapore, and then you can get into other things subsequently, right? Of course, I mean, obviously everyone wants to, they want to shoot something that's current, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, the Pranakan house has been here all, all their lives. So if that new beautiful building skyscrapers there, they all want to go shoot there, you know. And, and don't forget, it's not just there, but it's like right smack in the middle of the city, standing alone, you know. And, and that the whole area, the Marina Bay area, right? I mean, yeah. it's scenic. It's very scenic, and it's very very, you know, it defines Singapore at least for me now, mm -hmm. you know. At least okay. when, when I say for me now, but also more from the outsider looking in, right? Mm -hmm. They kind of know that Singapore. Last time they weren't really sure because you know, yeah. Okay. Grace, how about yourself? You don't have the experience uh, of the other gentleman uh, on the panel, but uh, you come in with fresh eyes. You've seen 
things. You've probably not seen some of the things that they've seen over the years. That's not true. But, uh, <laughs> Are you calling us old? Come on, come on. <laughs> you mean you guys are not? Okay, then fine. Everybody jump in as youngsters. Young and fresh <laughs> so anyway, Grace, so what are your thoughts on this? Um, well, I guess for many filmmakers and of course, I think photographers as well, um, we uh, try to capture an element of truth in our subjects. And um, even, you know, if I'm doing a uh, I'm directing a performance or uh, the performance of a character or um, even writing a script of um, a short film of what I want to say. Uh, a lot of it is also my response to how I am um, living in Singapore as a Singaporean. So um, even as a photographer or a filmmaker, the way we frame um, a subject or the way uh, we compose um, a certain thing is also a personal truth to us. And as a response, uh, it is also capturing Singapore as a very um, individual, as, as an individual, I guess. Yeah. So I feel that um, the subject is always there. And like what, and I agree with Brian, uh, we are his, his, in a way historians as well, because um, even if the landscape is always changing, the more we keep on being a photographer or being a filmmaker is always going to, we are always going to look back and it's always going to see, and we are always going to see the truth of what has happened in Singapore and the progress of our entire uh 50 years yeah mm. okay so you when i asked for photos you sent a, uh, a, a curious one from to me and i'm sure to many people so this this was yeah. your picture maybe you'd like to explain a bit about why you think this uh, reflects uh, singapore to some extent All right um so i call this 2020 um 20-20 20 20, like 2020 vision um but uh, what what is in the TV is actually uh, mimosas. So a mimosa is, is a plant, in, it's a wild pl uh, flower in Singapore where if you touch it, uh, it will shrivel up. Uh, the leaves will kind of um, close. So um, I guess this sort of, uh, I shot this in 2020 and uh, it was during the pandemic and so a lot of Singaporeans were in their house, in their homes, and a lot of them were watching Netflix, um, TV to keep them company. So kind of view Singapore that way in a way that we are looking through um, a lens of something that is sort of um, artificial in a way, because there's so, so much progress. And so the CRT is sort of a way to say that because I'm a 90s kid as well so um, I I had I guess I've lived through that um, CRT period through um, TV and through streaming and um, it, it, it kind of it's kind of like happening really fast and then now there's like TikTok and um, Instagram and everything else so there is that aspect of um, us looking through something that's um, filtered um, and then also because uh, I shot this in natural light so there's uh, there's this um, light emitting from the CRT which is man-made and artificial and then there's light that's actually natural that's lighting the, the whole TV and then everything is sort of a frame within a frame within a frame um, yeah so are you saying that so, we, we are a bit like the touch me not as in we shrink when we get exposed to something external influences yeah i think um we become very fragile because we are very safe in a way so what do you think is uh, a good sort of reflection of singapore beyond the physicality of singapore uh, are there aspects that you think come to mind more that project Singapore 
and which you can also capture on the lens. I don't think there's any one picture, like, Kana. There's no hmm. one photo. Or, or a series it. of pictures, yeah. you know. What, I mean, what, I what think exactly? it, it, takes, it takes everybody. So we have room for portraits. We have room for architecture. We have room for, for conceptual pieces like, like Grace's. We have room for street. Uh, to me, street is the easiest because it doesn't really take much thinking and planning. You just go around with a camera or these days with a phone and whatever you see that is interesting, you can just capture, you can just take a picture. Um, and these things are, are the things that down the line you will remember. You know, these are the, the things that, I mean, I remember just going through some pictures and I was like, oh, look, Sungai Market, you know, like the Sungai Road Market. And it's just not there anymore. And the whole place is gone, right? And um, but having all these things and, and you can show people and it's like, really, what? It's the same way that like, people for us, even though we are older, when we get those like, you know, look at Singapore in the 50s versus now, and you see those pictures, there's always that wow factor. Um, so there's no one picture. I think anybody who contributes, you know, adds to the narrative. Well, there's a lot of uh, photography going, going around now with uh, smartphones, right? You've got so many people clicking and sharing. There's so many platforms to share these things. Uh, do you... Do you get a sense of a general sort of feeling about Singapore that comes through all these social media platforms and uh, other avenues that uh, get a chance to expose these, uh, photogra these photographers, these new photographers um, into society? Do you think there's a, there's a new description for Singapore that could come out as a result of that? No, I think, uh, Galan, that's a very interesting question because I think a lot of young people these days, they, they live their lives on Instagram. Uh, and if, you know, if, if someone goes on Facebook, they're like, oh, you're an old person. Okay. And yeah, so, so the thing is, uh, when you live your life on Instagram, you, you see a very particular kind of representation uh, depending on the people you follow and the stuff that gets thrown into your feed. Uh, and uh, the, the thing is, uh, you, you have to be very careful when you scroll through Instagram because uh, in a way, you are building your own idea of the, the, the country or the city that you want to see based on who you're following and whose feed you're looking at. Uh, and and I, I used to get uh, a little bit upset uh, with some of the stuff that I see on Instagram because, you know, it, it's like uh, sometimes, well, there was a time when there were a lot of young people doing very dangerous things, uh, rooftoping and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And then you know, they, they would share their images on Instagram because, you know, it, it was a, 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 a platform for them to show how cool or how daredevil they were and stuff like that. And But uh, I've realized that there are also a lot of other uh, channels and images that you can see on Instagram and and really uh, this idea of the the city you live in and the place you live in is what you make of it uh, is is really true when you look at Instagram and um, but uh, by and large Instagram is dominated by a lot of influencers uh, who portray uh, this very sleek and polished lifestyle that they may or may not actually lead in real life, uh, but they want to show on Instagram. And, and I think the danger is for uh, young and maybe impressionable people to, to buy into that lifestyle and to think that, oh, this is what I want and this is the city that I live in and it's cool and everything is nice and dandy and you know stuff like that. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you, you talk about you know, how you want a bit more truth maybe in your images. But in the commercial world, you have to project the yeah. sense of what you're trying to sell, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that, Russell, you've been doing for quite a long time. Uh, do you ever find yourself in that uh, you know, odd frame of mind where, oh, this is not real, this shouldn't be it? I've been faking it really long time, so <laughs> trying to make it nicer than it seems. I mean, that's a commercial world, right? You know, yeah. who wants to sell a crappy product, right? Mm -hmm. Even if it's a crappy product, you got to make it look good. But that, that's a bit different, you know. But I think that we're talking about Instagram. This is supposed to be this guy's or this girl's life and experiences. But then again, you got to understand, you know, you're not going to get a lot of likes when you shoot a messy room. You're going to get a lot of likes when you're in, when you're in a five-star hotel, in a jacuzzi. Sure. You know, so, so but, but it, the, the person's, whole, yeah. 
messy room also matters. If you're a famous person, you show a messy room, you might get a lot more likes than your sleep. Well, it uh, depends. It depends. Room, right? You know, it depends. You know, and and I, I a very uh, a very close friend of mine who is quite a major, um, you know, Instagrammer in terms of uh, the market. He he's actually a a, a private chef. You know, and and he puts up uh, you know food pictures as like everyone does, and he has an amazing blog tell, telling you about his recipes. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are real recipes, you know. I, I mean, he, I mean, he's based in Tokyo, so when he makes ramen, he tells you how to make the real ramen, which is might not be the most sexy thing, right? So he tells me if he puts like blue ramen, <laughs> if he makes like blue noodle ramen in there, that tastes bad, but it looks interesting. He gets more likes. Than just your normal tonkotsu, uh, bone marrow, uh, pork bone, you know, ramen, and so like so, how do you balance it? Mm. You know, are you going to give real information like him? He wants to give real recipes, what your actual good food looks like that you can cook at home, or do you want to just jazz it up and make all these crazy dishes that you really don't want to eat or don't want to cook? So therein lies like how do you how do you balance it? Like a lot of restaurants now go for that Instagrammable shot, right? Be the decor. Yeah, but but the what's food. the Instagrammable shot? Something that's not necessarily like it will taste good, you know, like these designer restaurants, right? Yeah, it looks great on the plate. But, you know, sometimes the ugliest food, like Chakwe Tiao or something, <laughs> it's, just, oh, it's yeah. like no, the, the, ugly, the ugly food tastes good, you know, but maybe it doesn't get the likes. Therefore, I want to build a, the audience. I want to get the endorsements. So it's all hand in hand, right? Because people mm. are, are using it not just purely to, to show you their life and to show you a documentary in life, what's like. Yeah, there are people doing it. But most people, I guess, want the likes, they want the endorsements, they want the money, they want the target audience. And therefore, you put this kind of a stuff in it. Yeah. How are the people of Singapore, are they, do they make a good subject matter to be photographed do they I mean, look at look at this reflect. screen here right you got yeah. a chandran you got a wong a so a van der beek and a song <laughs> this is singapore right i mean yeah it's a, it's, a it's it's singapore and we are we used to mm. it and i think it's very 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 dangerous to use one image and to paint it all with one broad stroke because yeah you know just Maybe like america not. the different parts of america mm. right that define America because you're all immigrants, you know, um, just like for us, we're all immigrants. So, so that part of it, I always, and most people that travel and visit me and most part of it, they're always quite taken aback, obviously by the food, but then again, you got to understand the food is amazing because we have so many different races, mm-hmm. right? If it's just mm-hmm. chicken rice, I think we all be bought, <laughs> you yeah. know, so the people still make it for me, the people still, Still is is still the driving force, and not it's just the rest is just a it's just buildings and a shell. Hmm. Okay. What would you? How would you project Singapore then? Russell. Me. Hmm. You know, I mean, to me, the typical scene. I don't know. That to me, it's I like I love kopitiams. You know, I like hanging out kopitiams. You're sitting there. There's a Chinese family. There's an Indian family. There's a Middle, I mean, you know, it's like a watering hole, right? So that to me, the kopitiam is quite a cross section of 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 what our society is, I feel. And the type of food we eat, you know, and right? Yeah. It's where the community and neighborhood hangs out. It's like mm-hmm. this watering hole where everyone goes to. Sure. You know, whether okay. you are some CEO or whatever, or whatever, whatever, you still want your kopi, right? You know, I brought up to your okay. nice office. <laughs> you know, it's, it's still to me, that's, that's a DNA to me that I, I don't think it'll be worn off, you know. Yeah. Okay. How about you, Darren? How would you represent Singapore in a shop? Well, and you know, I feel that beyond all the glitzy skyline and all that of Singapore, uh, what really makes the country, if you talk about architecture, uh, which is what I do for a living, is is the public housing of Singapore. Uh, because we, we are known to have the world's best public housing program, but what does that actually mean? Uh, and so what I've done, you know, in the past decade or so is I, I've just gone and photographed HDB estate after HDB estate. Uh, I mean, if you look at this background behind me right now, it's, it's, a, it's a block of uh, recently painted 
uh, HDB flats uh, in Circuit Road, uh, Macpherson. And uh, the, this block of flats is, is not new. It's very old. It's from the 1980s. Uh, it's uh, back during the days when the HDB still built masonets, uh, which are these double-story flats. And uh, But they've recently been painted in this really interesting color uh, with the, you know, you, you see the prismatic patterns across it. Mm-hmm. And for, for public housing, uh, there are a lot of people out there who think that, you know, uh, they're all the same. Uh, a flat is a flat, a, a HDB flat is a HDB flat. How different can it be? But uh, for like 80% of Singaporeans who live in public housing, um, you know, your your estate has an identity and and a lot of this comes from the architecture as well as uh, the food, obviously, because uh, different parts of Singapore are known for different food. We, we, we can't run away from food. Food as an identity is always going to be part of Singapore. But uh, the image that I, I've shared is uh, an image of uh, 56 HDB blocks uh, that were built in the first uh, 20 years of the HDB's existence. So from 19... Uh, 60 to 1979 and uh, the thing is many of these flats uh, don't exist anymore and also many of them have been repainted uh, because in Singapore every seven years uh, you're, the town council is required by law to repaint the HDB flats and uh, mm-hmm. these days repainting becomes a, a very large part of uh, establishing the identity of an estate because uh, it, it allows you to to recognize where you are, uh, which is apart from somewhere else uh, mm-hmm. in terms of uh, an HDB estate. So uh, it, this project is really going to be ongoing for the longest time until I can no longer do it because uh, it keeps changing, this uh, public housing landscape of Singapore. But mm-hmm. I think this is uh, one of the defining things of uh, the Singaporean experience for most people who live here. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, do you also see that uh, this perhaps reflects some of the identity of Singapore? It's, you know, it's changing. The, the buildings are getting a lot more uh, swish, uh, you know, less sort of blockish, you know, more unusual shapes coming up and stuff. Like, do, do you think some of that you can capture maybe in a timeline to reflect the changes that have been taking place. I think uh, this the idea that uh, older HDB flats are, are more uniform and usually quite boring it is actually not so true because the HDB had always been very experimental when it came to building mm. uh, different kinds of blocks and they've been doing this from the start. Uh, I, I've documented a fair amount of this. So uh, if you want to find out more, you can buy the book. Okay. Sure. Hey, Sorry. Okay. Just, Let us know when it's out. <laughs> yeah, well, it'll be hopefully out at the end of the year. But uh, the thing is, uh, a lot of uh, jokes aside, a lot of uh, how new HDB blocks are built uh, reflects the, uh, the desires of the people, actually. Uh, people nowadays want privacy a lot more than uh, this whole like common corridor mm. concept of uh, community. So, so uh, we have less units on every floor and uh, we have uh, very smaller common corridors and things like that. So they're all reflective mm. of, of people's desires, actually. This is changing of society as well, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Brian, for you, how would you reflect Singapore? <clears throat> for me, it's the people. I mean, and I mean, I, I, a lot of people do things very well. Uh, Darren does the buildings, so I don't have to worry about all that kind of stuff. But I think uh, <laughs> it, it's the people, and you know what? It's really it's whatever the people are doing and where they are. So, if they happen to be in an old part of town or a new part of town or in anywhere, uh, it's basically what they do, and it's very at odds, right? You see all these really like like you guys are talking about this really slick, nice imagery and. Living here, we know it's not all true, but it is a facet. So there is that that demographic of people, but there's also a lot of other demographics. And by nature of wanting to showcase Singapore at its sparkling finest, that's the one that gets seen most. Um, but all of us who have gone to the, the wet markets know the grumpy auntie or the, the friendly uncle, and they're all characters in their own right. So 
it, it really takes all sorts. Uh. And so for me, I mean, Russell would probably do a much better job taking portraits. For me, it's just getting pictures of people, of them doing what they do, daily life. Yeah, so, natural. Yeah, so it's not a one picture thing. It's just basically a collection of everything that, that you do. Just look at it and just get, oh yeah, I remember that. Oh, that looks familiar. That's the kind of thing that I see. Grace, for you, how would you reflect Singapore? Yeah, I, I, I'm still um, trying to find um, a way to how to show Singapore because um, right now, a lot of it is nostalgia. And um, I think um, since Singapore always changes, it's always redefined and reimagined. In, and so as me, as like a 20 plus year old, um, looking at Singapore, uh, sort of look at what is happening right now and how it's go how Singapore is going to be in the future um, if we keep progressing this this at this rate. Mm -hmm. Metadata is is also a little bit about um, the current uh, times now, um, where not just in Singapore but in the whole world, where uh, things just are just changing at a rapid pace and and the, the landscape of the world is changing very fast, especially for COVID. Um, so, so I guess Singapore in itself, I, I, I'm still trying to find out what, what um, where, our, where we stand uh, as opposed to the whole world, yeah. And what is the most dynamic uh, period for taking pictures for the photographers who've been shooting over a period of time? I mean, if you wanted to photograph riots and stuff, then the sixties, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think, ev of... yeah, but I think every era is got its own mm. allure. So we only live a very small slice of history, each of us, <laughs> and I think it's up to us to make of it. You know what we want of it, and then mm -hmm. if you look at photography or even films, moving pictures, uh, the, the films and the photos from every era, every generation has, they are, have their own draws and uh, unique, uh, you know, subjects and, you know, selling points. Hmm. Do you think technology has helped or kind of made things more artificial as a result of all the different things you can put into a photograph? Has it, have you... Has it lost the essence of, of the shot? Russell, mm. Brian? Uh, I think, you know, just, it's a double-edged sword, right? You know, like the very fact we're doing this now, that's technology, it's helped, you know, but mm. I think I think to be a slave of technology, that's when a problem comes in, right? Mm. Or using technology and abusing it, that's when a problem comes in. But humans are humans, they're going to abuse it, right? Mm. So you know, um, and, and, uh, and it's what's real out there, what's authentic out there. That's, that's, that to me, that's more the bigger problem. What's credible and what's authentic out there. Mm -hmm. Cause now when you look at the image, you don't know whether that's real or fake, mm -hmm. right? I mean, a lot of my images, even people, and they go, is that Photoshop? Was she there? <laughs> like they they yeah. don't even know what to believe. And that to me is, is dangerous because you know, um, you don't know. You don't know what, what, what's put in front of you, right? I mean, people can change stuff, change faces, whatever. Uh, that to me do is you try and, problem. Sorry. Huh? Yeah. Do, do you try and inject some uh, authenticity into some of your commercial work? In any way? I mean, you try as much, but you know, the damn ad, ad agency, can I swear here? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the, 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 the damn ad agency, they're going to go Photoshop that sucker, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, how many times... Show me, show me an ad, a beauty ad with a woman in it or a guy in it that's not touched. That's the mindset. That's the mindset. People can't accept because his, his, his skin is not smooth or her skin is not pristine. That's the mindset and it's really, really sad. Because that's very, like, to me, that's, that's very, very, very misleading you know, in terms of advertising. Yeah. Right. So that's the part that I, I grapple with. And I've been, yeah, I've been guilty of it because I just give them the picture and they go clean it up and they go spray it up. You know, <laughs> you know yeah. they go fry it. Like I said, they just go fry it. And then you don't know what you're getting. You the woman doesn't even look like her. Right. Yeah. Unless you're doing documentary, mm -hmm. then of course you don't touch it. 
So mm. yeah. I mean different Would you rather do documentary work though? No, it's not that it's not that I rather. It's not that I rather. I think you know, I think only documentary work that you don't, you know, you don't uh, doctor the image up. You know, mm. so when I shoot for a fashion magazine, that stuff is all fried. When I say fried, I mean just touched mm. up. Of course yeah. I ask them not to do it, you know. Um, and then you shoot for like a Time magazine. It's a different mindset. You're not supposed to touch it, which mm. to me is great. That's why the credibility, it's not just about touching up, it's the credibility of the photo. Did mm. that leopard really lie under the tree? Or did you shoot that in Amokyo? <laughs> <laughs> you went to Mandai to shoot a leopard and zap. <laughs> you know. But yeah. then again, I always tell people, part of the fun is saving up and going to Africa and waiting for the shot. That's the fun of it. You know, that's the fun of it, right? I mean, like, mm. Darren can shoot one block and he make a mosaic, you know, and he go put yeah. color and then he's done a different block, <laughs> yeah. you know, but I mean, he goes out and he, you know, with his tripod and lines it up and wait for the light. That's what a photographer, to me, does. We talked about the digital aspects, uh, the photoshops and, and stuff, but I think for me, um, and I'm sorry, Darren, we've heard this before many times, <clears throat> um, digital platforms <laughs> are great. I think that they've given uh, a lot of people access to photography, you know, mobile phones, Instagram. They have given people a lot of access to photography and raised an interest. But on the flip side, I think that to see images on a small screen, uh, and of course, everybody wants likes, right? So they will, ca they will cater and tailor their images towards that small screen. Uh, what basically we end up with is uh, very two-dimensional pictures that are read very well, very easily when they're small. Um, and all of us from earlier generations, um, sorry, Grace, yes, we are old. Um, from the early generations, we remember seeing pictures in the photo book where you know you you, you take out an A1 uh, or an A3 size or A4 size book and you look at the, all the details in the image and you can pour over one photograph for you know a few minutes just to look at all the little individual things happening. It doesn't happen anymore. So uh, you can, you can still shoot it, but when you put it on Instagram, people are going to look at it as what's that and they're just going to move on. The attention span uh, is 1.8 seconds. Yeah, yeah very much go. less. Uh, so my biggest worry about that is that uh, this the, the younger generation will have a, a stunted view of photography in the sense that they don't see things big. They see things small and they see things simple. So they, 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 they're missing out on that. That's not to say that they don't have their own visual language. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think that it takes all sorts. You, you need the, the easy reads and you need the complex reads. So to me, that's the bigger scary thing of of the, mm. the modern digital. But then again, yeah. Brian, like, you know, it's it's just, like you said, right? I picked up on it. It's like a stunted view, a stunted view of your visual aspect. You know, sad to say, it's not just the visual aspect. It's their life in general. It's, they don't read paragraphs, man. They read, they read like a cluster of captions. Tweets. Read captions yeah. with no verbs. With some <laughs> little... Uh, emojis but still they communicate and they seem to do it quite well and very quickly and you know they still get the well, word out yes and no it's yes a, and no i think i think it's nothing like you can't get information from phrases i'm sorry no you can't you, you right? need a lot of phrases you know so the attention the span is like wait, my, my, my kid my kid my, he can't concentrate yeah because you know you're feeding the guy like emojis and phrases mm. not you know so yeah like the the visual part of it that's that's just a symptom you know right they can't bite onto something, sit down, read a whole page or a paragraph, right? How many of these guys, like you, you put a six, a six paragraph, in the Instagram, you think they read it, honestly? Yeah. <laughs> they just look, okay, swipe, 1.5 yeah. seconds, boom, you're gone. But that's our society now, right? Mm -hmm. It's fast, it's quick, a lot of noise. Like, like, like you say, yeah. they don't pour over a picture, right? They don't pour over a picture. That's why to me, movies are great or movies are great. You, you have to sit there in that dark room, right? When Grace, when you do that scene, they have to look at every single corner. It's that one scene that's not going to move and they got to eat this stuff up. It's like force feed this guy, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and you switch everything Actually, off when you're in that room. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> it's, it's the, this attention span thing is, is threatening our, uh, the filmmaker's livelihood mm. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, we're all in trouble because... <laughs> um, Making a film right now um, is, is so much harder um, just because of this attention span. Um, so do you cut your scenes up? Long? I mean, you don't have long scenes in there? You do like like the commercial, like three second scenes and you're done? 
Yeah, well, I know exactly like what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some, sometimes I will have to do it. Yeah, like I have to don't take out a shot them, because Grace. it's too don't long. Don't give in to them. Yeah. Don't give but in to them. But it's commercial. <laughs> no, man, Grace, don't give in to them. Let the guys so sit we, in that movie cinema. I, and watch I, I, I recently, <laughs> I recently made a documentary film, and and our opening sequence is one minute long. Like one. Oh, you lost shot. a lot of money there, Aaron. And <laughs> but but you know it's it's a uh, it's a documentary. So, uh, I, I we were slightly worried that the some people might not last the opening scene, but we went ahead anyway. Yeah. Uh, is is a is a documentary out? Yeah, it's called While You Were Sleeping. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, if you Google it on YouTube, it's it's there. Uh, okay. Yeah. Did you get a lot of comments about your one minute opening? Actually, uh, maybe my audience is older because uh, most of the comments that I got feedback from people was that the whole film was too short. So I, I take that as a good thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Good. Um, there's one other question about funding. Is, do, you, do you see uh, there's enough support uh, coming in to fund, say, your private projects, uh, not just the commercial stuff? Grace, your, yours recently just came out yeah. uh, because of the funding, right? That helped. Yeah. Um, so uh, funding is always very hard. To, I mean, to get, uh, it's very important for a filmmaker because unfortunately, filmmaking is, is a very expensive art. Um, but uh, so for me, I was very fortunate to be uh, getting the grant for the Film Facilitation Fund. So that was for uh, MYFA. A nation, our national youth um, mm -hmm. film uh, awards, yeah. yeah. So um, that's how I got to make metadata. And mm -hmm. I think um, initiatives like that really help um, the, uh, or really helped me as a youth, uh, young filmmaker, yeah. Mm -hmm. How about the rest of you guys? Uh, did you get support of that nature, you know, to do, to do your own projects uh, along the way? Yeah, the... The the HTV book that I'm going to be doing uh, is partially funded by the National Heritage Board. So they have a project grant that you can apply for. Uh, so I think that there, there are sources for funding, uh, either public or private out there. Uh, sometimes I, I sell my prints, uh, limited edition prints, in order to raise money for my books. Mm. Uh, and, and so... It's really up to the individual to to see how he or she wants to try and raise the money. You can do Kickstarter, Indiegogo, you know, all kinds of things. And mm -hmm. and I think that if the project is genuine and you know decent, there will be people who are willing to support it. Okay. Um, Brian and Russell, how about your projects? Did you get any funding? Um, send the money. I don't care where it's coming from. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's no, that's a part. Like, I mean, all of us creative people, right? Like Grace, yeah. people, that's the last thing you want to deal with. It, you have to deal it, with it. Right? A, I know, but it's a pain. You mm -hmm. want to create images, you want to shoot. Man, don't like, you know, you dress up and you go see these people, you know, whoever it is. <laughs> that that's I know it's part of it. And it's like the you know, I don't think any creative person likes it. Mm -hmm. You know, so whatever sources are out there, you know, whatever, you know banks or i mean then you you go 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 get go get it i mean i yeah i mean that that that's that's the my biggest uh um the problem i think that's really, generally yeah. the the main issue for a yeah, lot of, of, course, of course, endeavors, like, you know, right? yeah so so that part i mean obviously if someone helps you do that then it's great they can take take charge of that mm. you know and because i mean like even for me i have no idea like how to you know how to fill these forms up, right? <laughs> the grants and, and you know and all that. You know until someone comes along and he does helps me do it. Oh, there's this thing for this this project. If you fall with it, I mean that part of it because we don't really look up. I, I mean, you know. Um, but it's there, right? I mean, it's there. It's just yeah, it's there. Of, yeah. Of it's, it's there. It and, and, and it's yeah, yeah it's, it's there. And you know, of course, you got to go read everything and figure mm -hmm. it out. And and I'm not saying that it, it can't be done. A lot of people do it. You know, so that that's the part that of course is the least. You know, the okay. least enjoyable part, yeah. right? Brian, Grace, Russell, and uh, Darren, thanks, thanks for being on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks to the audience for your questions as well. Uh, I know we didn't get a chance to cover all of, a lot of them, but uh, 
I think there's a lot of stuff going on in terms of how we're going to project Singapore down the line. Grace, uh, you can bring a different lens to it. You can bring your own perspective to it and try and see how we can keep Singapore relevant down the line because you're going to get new audiences coming in. And as Darren said, we only live a, a sliver of that time that we are on this planet. We can do what we can. So it's up to you to pick up some of that and carry it on through uh, and bring it to, to greater awareness. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.